Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to be together to, again today. I uh, hope you're doing well. hope uh, everybody's um, keeping uh, safe as they can. Uh, really encouraged this morning to bring you God's word. It is a, a great word for us. Uh, we're continuing our series uh, in the book of Acts called um, The Acts of the Risen Christ. Uh, no great uh, surprise there. Uh, the title of our sermon this morning is The Guarantee of the Risen Christ. But before we dive into God's word, um, let us just open with a quick word of prayer. Let's ask God to help us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who brings your word to life. I pray today that you would uh, shape our hearts through your spirit. You would reveal your will to us and you would strengthen us, encourage us and build us up that your word might be uh, sharper than a two-edged sword to us, Lord, uh, just cutting asunder soul and spirit, dividing the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Father, we pray today that you would give us clear uh, minds and, Lord, you would give us soft hearts that we might receive your word and it might produce for you a harvest of righteousness, 30, 60, 100-fold for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I remember back when Jenny and I were first married back in the 90s, uh, we had a home loan with one of the big four and it was 17%. Uh, to be honest, we had no hope of paying that off. Uh, I just, um, I was self-employed, uh, just started a, a business, a uh, lawn mowing, tree lopping business. And in those days, uh, being self-employed wasn't that common and the banks weren't too keen on uh, lending, uh, especially at a good rate, uh, to those who were self-employed. Uh, we went and saw the bank manager. Those days we had a bank manager that you could see. And we went and saw Italo Baraldi at the Coromel Westpac branch. And uh, he said something to us that afternoon he said to us, uh, don't worry, I'll take care of it. It'll be all right. Well, we went home and he said he, he, would, uh, he would enter all the information and he'd have an answer for us that night and he would call us so that we wouldn't be left in suspense. He knew that it was, it was really bothering us and, and um, sure enough, it rang up about 7 o'clock that night and he said, you have been approved. Now, that was a great relief to us, a really great relief. And it's just wonderful when somebody who has the authority to do something and, uh, and they say they're going to do something and they actually do it. And that's what our passage is about today. The Lord Jesus Christ gives Paul a guarantee and he actually backs it up and does it. And that... Uh, guarantee governs the whole passage and everything that happens in it. Um, let's pick it up at verse 9 and 10. They're the key verses in this passage. That's the guarantee. So let's read them from Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. Now, uh, I'm just thinking for the risen Lord to say that must mean that Paul's feeling a bit afraid. He's feeling a bit uh, uh, apprehensive about uh, going into Corinth. Um, and let's not forget the guarantee isn't... Uh, from Italo Baraldi at the Westpac Bank. Now, this is from the, the risen Christ, the Lord Jesus himself. Um, now, just uh, I want you to know that even though the guarantee is specifically for the Apostle Paul, it offers us some level of comfort and encouragement, especially when you think of what Paul has been going through, what he's gone through in the previous 
a uh, few towns. Um, so let's see the background to Jesus giving this guarantee to Paul. If you're following in our outline, uh, we'll be mailing, emailing that out, of course. Uh, point one, the background of the guarantee. You might have received it already. I hope so. Uh, verse one, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Paul has been at Philippi and then through Berea and Athens, and now he's at Corinth. Corinth is this massive cosmopolitan city. It's trendy. It's alive. It's bustling. It's full of life. And, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty uh, pretty out there city. Uh, plenty of gods um, as well, uh, especially, uh, um, yeah, it's a sexualized city. And um, uh, you might think Paul's afraid because of the size of Corinth, but uh, we note later that when Paul arrives in Rome, which is a bigger city, he's not afraid at all. Uh, you might remember uh, when Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians, he said this, when I came to you, brothers, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 3. So I'm thinking Paul's feeling a little bit insecure and afraid, and if you want to be honest, uh, the second mission trip hasn't been a roaring success, has it? For example, Paul's keep, Paul keeps finding himself in trouble. Uh, he's beaten. He's put into jail at Philippi. And a handful of people are saved there. He gets to Thessalonica and he's in trouble again, and a riot breaks out, doesn't it? But he's rushed away and by the Christians and he escapes, of course, to uh, Berea. Uh, in Athens, he sneered at uh, as he preaches about Jesus and the resurrection. All the philosophers sneer and jeer at his message, call him, uh, you know, seed picker, uh, you know, babbler. Uh, and they look down his nose and in all fairness, it's not what we would call a successful mission trip by any means. So after all the beatings, all the arrests, all the confrontation that Paul's had, um, I think Paul's probably at the end of his tether. I think Paul's uh, suffering from uh, fear and anxiety. And... Uh, Maybe you're feeling like that today. Maybe you're feeling tired like Paul or uh, maybe you're just uh, tired of being the only Christian in your family or the only Christian in your workplace or in your school or your group of friends. Maybe you're just tired of trying to share the gospel with people that uh, sneer at you because I can relate to that, honestly. Um, preaching the gospel week in, week out, wanting people to get saved, praying that they get saved and receive the message of salvation, not knowing if they do, not seeing any uh, dynamic fruit and dynamic growth uh, in the church, continually up against opposition uh, and those sorts of things can really make you a little discouraged. And I wonder, as I read today's passage, if Paul's uh, not feeling a little bit like that right now. Walking the 50 miles from Athens to Corinth, he probably reflected on the not-too-successful mission trip. He probably bought into thinking about what might happen at Corinth and how he might suffer beatings and be sneered at and maybe even perhaps thrown into jail and perhaps even worse, uh, like his Lord and Master. Well, the passage tells us that things take a turn for the better. Uh, he meets up with Aquila and his wife Priscilla. They're both tent makers and Paul joins them in that work and they've been turfed out of uh, Rome by Claudius. Uh, he's uh, ordered that all Jews leave Rome. And so they arrive there and that's some comfort for Paul. He's working as a tent maker through the week and then preaching in 
uh, on the weekend, uh, on the Sabbath, as we see in verse 4. And we now see the arrival of uh, Silas and Timothy as they come. Pick it up in verse 5, chapter 18. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, you know, that Paul's gone full-time in ministry due to their arrival because they haven't just brought some good news. Uh, they brought the offering uh, from the other churches as we see in some of other some of Paul's other letters. Um, now, as you guess, the Jews weren't that fussed about Paul preaching about Jesus, and it really got Paul's temper raised. Uh, and this is what uh, the outcome is in verse six. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, "Your blood be on your own heads." I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Can you feel Paul's frustration there? Can you feel his anxiety and his anger uh, that the Jews are rejecting the gospel again, that Christ is the Messiah, the Saviour, the one who's been predicted in the Scriptures? And he gets so frustrated he makes that decision and says, you know, blow it, forget it. I'm not going to preach to you guys again. Well, let your blood be on your own head. I'm off to, to the Gentiles. And that's an important decision uh, in the book of, of Acts as well. And I, um, I wonder deep down if Paul is feeling that it, it just might be happening again. It might be you know, Groundhog Day, that the beatings and all those things are just going to, uh, continue happening, and he he lets that frustration just, uh, uh, I guess, an outburst of, of anger, and says, "That's it." Um, today, if you visit uh, Thomas Carlyle's famous home in London, uh, they'll show you an almost soundproof room that he built so the noise of the street wouldn't interfere with his work. One of his neighbours had a rooster that crowed loudly three times a night and, of course, early in the morning. Carlisle protested to his neighbour uh, and his neighbour said, look, he only, he only crows a couple of times at night and once in the morning. And Carlisle, Carlisle said to him, if you only knew what I suffer waiting for that rooster to crow, you would understand what I'm going through. Like Carlisle, many of us are perhaps waiting for something bad to happen and, and, uh, and experiencing the unpleasant feeling of that event before it actually happens and in which case we're told that it probably will never happen. Being fearful, worrying about future events, Worrying about tomorrow might not even happen. And it's a sure way of us becoming anxious, fearful, and just really coming under the attack of the enemy. You know, time and time again, the scriptures tell us not to be afraid. Don't worry about tomorrow. And it tells us that. God is with us. Fear not. And that's exactly what Jesus says to Paul. Point two, the guarantee. Pick it up in verse nine. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. What a wonderful Promise, what a great vision to have for the Apostle Paul. The Lord means, of course, uh, the Lord Jesus, according to Luke's uh, usage of the term. And it's uh, reminiscent of the Old Testament, isn't it? Where God would address his servants and tell them, Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. And Jesus here is saying the very same thing to Paul because I guess he's afraid. 
That's when God usually tells us those things when we need to hear them. Paul was going to go on testifying and preaching and be strengthened by the presence and the protection of Christ. You know, Paul's fears and reluctance to preach the gospel uh, would have prevented him or tried to prevent him from preaching, but these words would have given him great comfort and, of course, would have caused him to overcome his fear and trepidation. You know, John Wesley's dying words were, the best of all, God is with us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? What great words from Wesley on his dying bed. And they are the the words that Jesus is telling Paul that he is, God is with him. It's 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 a wonderful assurance, isn't it? Paul has been given this guarantee to strengthen his heart, strengthen his resolve that he might continue to preach. And, of course, uh, we know that Paul later wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that his weakness was the means that God's strength would be with him, Christ's strength. You know, weakness is the most uh, was the element most needed in God's servants. Um, Paul said also that he was with you, he said it to the Corinthians, with you in fear and much trembling. And my preaching wasn't with words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. I think Paul was learning something very important. He was learning to be totally dependent on God, totally reliant on Christ's power and not his own strength. And that's a great lesson for us to learn. Uh, I recall a story from John Stott when he was in Australia. Uh, He was speaking on one occasion at the university mission in Sydney. And on the last night of the mission, as a result of an infection in his throat, he lost his voice. Nevertheless, he was persuaded to speak. Waiting in the side room beforehand, he whispered a request that the words of the thought in the flesh, verses from 2 Corinthians 12, be read to him. The conversation between Jesus and the Apostle Paul became alive to John Stott. Stott said, I beg you to take it away from me. And he felt Jesus answer him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Stott replied, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When the time came to speak, He cracked the gospel through the microphone in a monotone uh, voice, unable to lift any uh, emphasis at all. But all the time crying out to the Lord to perfect Christ's power through his weakness. Stop came back to Australia many times after that and on every occasion somebody had come up to him and said, do you remember that final service in the university great hall when you'd lost your voice? That was the night I came to Christ. As someone who is very aware of my own weaknesses, I find it encouraging that when I feel weak, I'm not alone. Dear brothers and sisters, As we put our faith in God, he turns our weaknesses into strength. Jesus would guarantee that Paul's ministry was going to be fruitful. And he does so with an interesting phrase, which provides another reason for the guarantee of Jesus' presence 
and protection. I do believe that this reason broadens out to us as well. Even though it's been a specific guarantee to Paul, it includes us also. Point three, the reason for the guarantee. Verse 10, that phrase that Jesus has many people in his city leans into the prediction that people will be saved. But it's not just talking about Jesus' ability to see into the future, but points to the truth regarding election or predestination, which is the truth that God has already chosen who's going to be saved. You might remember back in chapter 13, verse 48, Luke tells us that when the Gentiles heard the gospel, those who were saved were all those who were appointed for eternal life. Interesting, isn't it? All those who were saved were chosen. All those who were saved were selected. All those who were saved were picked. All those who were saved were appointed for eternal life. You see, all throughout Scripture, this truth is affirmed. And although it's not denying human responsibility and the acceptance of the gospel message, it is highlighting the fact that the Lord Jesus is using the gospel to save those who have already been appointed to eternal life. And that's the other reason why Paul has been protected and, of course, given this great guarantee so that he might preach the gospel and those who have been appointed to eternal life might be saved. Now, I want to ask you right now as you hear that gospel message that Jesus saves uh, from sin, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who would die and forget and bring forgiveness for every person who believes in him, offer eternal life and salvation for those who believe and accept the gospel. Perhaps you that's you this morning. Perhaps you are one of those people that have been appointed for eternal life. I want to encourage you to receive that message right now, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, to ask him to forgive your sins, to cleanse you, because that's what the Messiah was promised to do, to once and for all be offered to God for the sins of the world, that everyone who believes in him would be saved. You know, the thing that stands out in this passage, as I've said, is that Jesus has people in this city who aren't saved yet but are going to be as the apostle preaches the good news. So important, isn't it, that the gospel is preached, that the word of Christ be shared among us richly. And even though that mission hasn't been successful up until now, the encouraging truth in this passage is that nothing, nothing can stop the risen Christ from collecting his people wherever he wants and how he wants. I read a story just recently of an Indian water bearer who had two large pots, both hung on the ends of a pole which he carried across his back. One of the pots had a crack in it while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the house, the cracked pot always arrived half full. The poor cracked pot was so ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it was only able to accomplish half of what it had been made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be a bit of failure, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream. I'm ashamed of myself and I I want to apologise to you. 
I've been able to deliver only half my load because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to your house. Because of my flaws, you have to do all of this work and you don't get full value from your efforts. The water bearer said to the pot, did you notice that there were flowers only on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I've always known about your floor and I planted flower seeds on your side of the path. And every day, day while we walk back, you watered them. For two years, I've been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate the table. Without you being just the way you are, there would not be this beauty to grace the house and our dinner table. You know, thankfully, God uses cracked pots, broken vessels to bear his name. Hear me now. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. God uses imperfect people because imperfect people know their weaknesses and that, that is the catalyst for Christ's power to remain upon them because when we're weak, he is strong. You know, this guarantee gave Paul great confidence that people, Jesus' people, would come to faith in Corinth. It tells us that many people believed. And so can we have that sort of confidence as we share the gospel or water the seed of the word that's been already uh, spread. Because we've got to remember those words from the apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that our work in the Lord is not in vain. You know, that's it, reassuring, isn't it? To know that our work in the Lord is not in vain because of God's great power that lives within us, because of the power of the gospel that Paul said in Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of salvation to all who believe. Isn't that wonderful? And, you know, once again, the proof of the guarantee that, you know, Jesus was bringing that uh, to fulfilment it was coming to pass right before his eyes. Um, you know, Luke wants us to know that, and he shows us in verse 11 that Paul stayed there a year and a half. That's 78 weeks. And up until now, he's only been staying, he's only allowed to stay really for three weeks at best. And to make sure we get the point, Luke includes a particular incident that Paul was protected from. Let's pick it up in verse 12 through to 17. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the, Jew, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judge, judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanour or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I'll not be judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sothenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. You know, in the storyline of Acts, that's remarkable. It really is. The full force of the Roman legal system has actually acquitted Paul and 
he's been uh, set free without even speaking one word. You know, Luke wants us to see that the guarantee that Jesus made is coming true. Now, I, I did say that this guarantee is specifically for Paul, and that's true, but given uh, the context and the reason for the guarantee, we can also draw some encouragement from it. Not so much that we can't be harmed. Oh, no. There will be Christians that will be harmed for the sake of the gospel and their faith in Christ. But that the risen Christ has people here to be saved and we are part of that process. And although there may be opposition and struggles, there's always opportunity to share the gospel and we are part of his mission. You know, the great thing that we must take from this passage is that Jesus' great commission can't be stopped. And you know what? As we join Jesus in this mission, we can have assurance that he is with us as he you know, told us in that command, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 20, that he would be with us to the end of the age. As we make disciples, as we baptise people, as we go out on mission with Jesus, his, his mission, we can be assured that he is with us, that we are not alone. You know, Paul was encouraged and was given great boldness to share the gospel, and so can we. His zeal had returned to him. And he preached there every day for a year and a half. And many believed in Jesus Christ and were saved. My prayer is that your zeal would return today, that whatever fears you might have, whatever uh, anxiety or trepidation of the future, whatever might be stopping you from sharing the gospel and, and, and being a light in the darkness, being a good witness in your family or your, your, uh, your home, your workplace, your friends, would dissipate, that Christ's strength would come upon you, that your weakness would actually be turned into God's strength because God is in the business of strengthening his people. It's all throughout scripture that the weak become strong, that those who are uh, less likely to have influence have the greatest influence in, you know, building and uh, preaching God's kingdom. Perhaps you're afraid this morning. Perhaps you're worried about the future. Perhaps you're tired of uh, constant opposition, of feeling like you're alone or the only one, as I said that's a Christian in your uh, in circumstances. Then I want you to look into God's word and receive comfort, strength and assurance that he is with you, that his word will strengthen you and actually give you zeal to serve him all the days of your life. You know, Jesus is with you. And as the writer of Hebrews said, he will never leave you nor forsake you. If you're listening uh, this morning, I really encourage you to, to pick up God's word, to uh, continue to pray, continue to share the gospel with your friends and family, to uh, not be discouraged about what's happened in the past and don't anticipate in fear what might happen in the future because God is in control. He is sovereign and he has people that he has marked to be saved as they hear and receive the gospel message. Um, I want to pray right now and if you 
uh, uh, listening, watching, uh, I want you to uh, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, help us not to give into fear and allow it to stop us serving you and the gospel. Help us through your Holy Spirit to proclaim your truth with zeal and boldness. Help us to see and claim your protection, knowing we are shielded from real harm because of your faithful and eternal love. Remind us that whatever we do for you will bear fruit and is not in vain. Amen. If you have watched with us today, please let us know by uh, commenting on YouTube or going uh, to our website, Granville Community Baptist Church, uh, or contact me personally or one of the leaders uh, because we'd love to talk to you and we'd love to pray with you. Uh, uh, I'm going to close with, our, uh, with a benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless. Have a great week and uh, really hope to catch up with you very soon. Be patient. Um, uh, we've got a long way to go uh, to beat the COVID-19 uh, virus and I uh, want to just encourage you and thank you for your support, for your the way you've connected to one another and uh, the way you, you've kept uh, in contact and, and really uh, encouraged me uh, through, through listening and watching um, the uh, live stream. So God bless. Have a great week.